Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Nicola Talarico and I'm the regional director of Chemin Aqua Science for the region of Emena, the state for Europe, Middle East and North Africa. And in the name of full Chemin and the Chemin Aqua Science, I would like to give all of you the warmest welcome to today's webinar. Our recent past is strongly impacted by COVID-19 pandemic and the consequent different procedure that each government has implemented in every country. This is brought to a significant modification of our way to interact in our personal life, as well as with our business contact, with a significant impact on the process flow to share new insight. With the best wish that we go back to normality very soon in all the region, Kemin Aqua Science is a proud to organize a series of webinars on raw material and feed quality during this month of May. More webinars on new subjects will be organized later on. Today, we will focus the attention on the feed staff quality, their processing, and their final relationship with animal performance. Talking about fish feed, the quality is also linked with the production process. Not only when we look to their physical features, for instance, pellet quality, the durability, the sinking of floating properties, but also there is an impact of the applied process that they have on nutritional properties, as for instance, the availability and the digestibility of certain nutrients. We will also analyze how to optimize the feed process efficiency in the coming webinars, bringing to the aqua feed sector inside from external expertise as today speakers, as well as the Kemin long experience in developing with our customer and business partner, the correct application of certain additives with the consequent impact on feed process performance. A clear example can be represented by the importance of optimizing the moisture level of the dry mixed ingredients and their efficiency on feed process. This can bring new insight on how effectively switch, for instance, from dry to liquid additives, not only while looking to the pure efficacy of the additives, but also to their consequent impact on uh, feed production process. Today, we will start with a lecture made by Dr. Hans Bonn. Dr. Bonn, is a founder of aquaculture experience, experience sorry is a leading aquaculture consultant with more than 30 years of global aquaculture experiences is also the chairman of dutch aquaculture experts an international aquaculture platform featuring the most qualified aquaculture company and research institute in netherlands in his activity Hans is supporting his customer implementing project and the procedure that will support them from the selection of raw material to the optimization of final ratio, as well as to insight to optimize feed process. In his today lectures, is going to focus on the importance of the quality of the stab and stability of feed stuff. Before starting and giving the uh, the uh, word to Dr. Hans, I would like to have a couple of suggestions, a couple of tips for you. First of all, uh, we recommend to follow the presentation of Dr. Hans and keep the questions for the end of the session. At the end of uh, Dr. Hans' presentation, first of all, you will receive a pop-up with a couple of simple questions that you are free to answer. Secondly, we will start the question answer session and you can write your questions in the chat box that is normally at the bottom of your screen. I will summarize all the questions, uh, combining the one with the same subject and place this to Dr. Hans for, uh, Hans for his answer. 
all the other questions we are not able to answer today, during today's webinars, we will record and we will revert to you later on. With this, I give the word to Dr. Hans and with the, um, welcome to our first Kemin uh, webinars on aquafit quality. Please, Dr. Hans. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Um, well, all participants, uh, very welcome. Thank you for joining uh, my talk today. Um, I have to admit that I am a little bit nervous because it's the first ever webinar that I am doing. So I hope you bear with me uh, in case something goes wrong or if I make a mistake. But anyway, um, I will do my best to make it uh, worthwhile for you to sit out this uh, half hour uh, of my, uh, my talk. Um, just a little bit about my background, my professional career. Um, I'm a biologist by education from Wageningen University. And uh, I held, uh, let's say, uh, I, I held uh, several positions in uh, Provimi uh, Aquafeed Division uh, from uh, 1989 to 2008. And that's actually where I got my practical training in this field uh, of uh, Aquafeed in the broadest sense. Um, in uh, 2008, Provimi uh, division was sold to uh, Biomar and the remaining part of Provimi was sold to Cargill. Um, and then I started my consulting uh, company, uh, Aquaculture Experience. I have, let's say, main, uh, some main activities I listed here before, so you can uh, gather a little bit what, where I'm coming from. Um, I have two types of main clients, or two main types of clients, uh, aqua feed companies uh, that I help with strategy, with nutrition and feed formulation, ob obviously the core of my, uh, my expertise, um, but also with uh, production optimization and raw material selection, as Nicola already pointed out. Uh, also, I help uh, many aqua feed ingredients and additive suppliers uh, with their business development, uh, sometimes market studies. Um, and uh, research development projects of these uh, ingredients and additives. And occasionally I do, do due diligence of feed related uh, companies. Okay, then the topics of my talk today. Um, <clears throat> I just uh, made you a little bit of a diary. Uh, first of all, uh, a little bit on aqua feed quality and stability. Uh, then I'll speak about raw material selections and least costing. Actually, these first three topics are very much related. Then I will zoom in a little bit into biological stability and I took one topic, mold prevention. And the last part of my talk will be mostly on physical pellet quality and starch gelatinization, uh, including with some practical examples of how feed quality, the total concept of feed quality finally works out in performance of animals. And of course, I'll have, end up with a summary. Okay. So if we look at aquafeed stability, what are the quality parameters that we are looking at? So first of all, we have the nutritional quality and stability. So they are basically, they are chemical and biological features of a product. So these are the nutrient compositions like protein and fat and amino acids, but also you can think of the gelatization level of the starch in the diet. What are the, is the oxidative status and stability of the product? And when you think about the biological stability, uh, you think more about mycotoxins, uh, so byproducts produced by molds. Uh, biogenic aminis, which are present in uh, fish meal or, or uh, animal proteins uh, when not treated properly and volatile nitrogen. And then <clears throat> you have stuff like undesirable substances like heavy metals, antimicrobial residues, pesticides, but also <clears throat> a flavor of a feed is a quality parameter, which is important for attractants, for example. If we look more at the physical quality, you are dealing with stuff like density. So is, are we dealing with a floating or a sinking product? What is the texture of the product? So can it, for example, absorb liquids? Um, after an extrusion, we are uh, coating the products with oil many, in many cases. 
um, what is the uh, water stability of the products. So such things like uh, pellet integrity in water, uh, which is extremely important for shrimp. We'll come to speak, we'll zoom into that part later on. Um, durability, so that deals with the transportation damage, how resistant is your uh, pellet to that, or how good it is handled in a feeding machine. Things like hardness, uh, so broken pellets and fines, um, but also appearance and uniformities. The blue, blue highlighted points are coming back later in the talk, so I will zoom, the in, zoom into more or less cases with these. So <clears throat> when we talk about quality, it all starts with, let's say, the raw material selection and the quality of the raw materials. Because you can do whatever with your feet. If you don't start your product with, uh, with proper quality raw materials, you will never be able to produce a decent quality final product. Um, so that is the basis. And that's why I wanted to zoom into a little bit in this raw material selection and in two topics of that, uh, in protein sources and oil, oil sources. So what are the nutritional aspects that we look at when we select our protein sources? Uh, so of course, the protein content, protein amino, amino acid level, uh, profile, what are the digestibility of these uh, components, but also in proteins, uh, protein sources, you'll find a lot of other nutrients like oils, the minerals, the vitamins, pigments that can be useful in, for the final products that you want to produce but also the presence of anti-nutritional factors, which are, let's say, a downside <coughs> of, uh, of or, or a negative nutritional aspects. Quality parameters that we are looking at in uh, generalizing for protein sources are already mentioned, freshness. So stuff like biogenic aminis. If the raw material, the, the, the original raw material of fish, for example, that when you produce a fish meal is not fresh or, or chilled well, you'll get the byproduct of biogenic aminis, which have a negative impact of, on the digestibility and the health of the fish. Oxidative status and stability, biological stability already mentioned. Of course, not maybe only uh, really to protein sources, this is related, but especially in cereals, of course, mycotoxins are very uh, known as causing problems uh, when molds uh, develop. But also, again, the biogenic aminos, which have, let's say, uh, to do with the bio biological stability. As already mentioned, undesirable substances. Uh, so, <clears throat> Uh, heavy metals or antimicrobial residues. These are very relevant when we speak, for example, of, of poultry byproduct meals. If these animals have been treated before consumption by some pesticides uh, or antimicrobial, then obviously in your raw material, you'll find that back. Then other quality aspects, which are more related to, <clears throat> uh, yeah, let's say, the other choices that a nutritionist and the purchaser make. And so I, th I think it's important to realize why I show you this overview is that, let's say the purchasers and the nutritionist in a company, um, together they are deciding on which materials they are using in their diets. So then our topics are coming up like availability and reliability of supply. Well, for the nut nutritionist, things like Palatability and attractability are, attractability are important. How well do these, this raw material behave in the manufacturing process? And then last but not least, what is the shelf life? So how long can you keep it in your plant? But even more important, the price. So how much are you going to, pre, pre, to pay for the protein level and amino acid level, etc., that you are adding into your diet? If we then look at, <clears throat> let's say, how this purchaser and nutritionist together look at this, I just made this overview to give you an idea uh, how you could evaluate raw materials. And this is, okay, I won't say that a nutritionist on a daily basis sits with an overview like this, but at least the criteria that are mentioned here uh, are the ones that he is considering. Uh, so on the top line, we see the raw materials listed 
a fish meal, poultry meal, hemoglobin, hydrolyzed feather meal, etc., etc., with their most common levels of nutrients. Of course, I don't went didn't went into too much detail, but let's say the protein levels, typical protein levels, fat levels, etc. But also the other uh, quality aspects. So I listed them <coughs> like protein quality, amino acid profile, and then. <coughs> When they are marked green, they have, let's say, generally a positive aspects in aquafeed. When they are yellow, they are more neutral. When they are orange, they are variable, and red, they are a negative aspect. So, <clears throat> obviously, a fish meal in general, uh, I just take one example, I'm not going to go one by one through them because then it will going to be <laughs> take too much time in this presentation, uh, but, uh, Fish meal has a very good protein quality, very good oil quality. Uh, the market perception of fish meal in a diet is good. There is no issues of GMO discussion. Although the price, uh, I, I state here 1500 euros per ton, but it can re really be much higher than that. Um, anti nutritional factors are absent. Oxidative stability can be a little bit variable, depends on the origin of the, of the raw materials, etc., etc. So you can see, in it, this is an overview that makes it easy for a nutritionist, a feed formulator, and a purchaser uh, to consider the different aspects of the raw materials that they are buying. If you look at oil sources, it's a little bit different. I, it's, I just uh, summarized it a little bit more, but obviously there the fatty acid profile and digestibility of the nutritional side are important. And other quality aspects are the melting point, the oxidative status, uh, availability and raw material, uh, reliability of supply, obviously, um, the undesirable substances and the price. So again, if we take make an overview like that, I took the most common uh, oil sources used in Aquafeed. Um, I'll take another one as, as an example, for example, uh, rapeseed oil. Rapeseed oil is very often, uh, very commonly used in, in aquafeed, um, but the fatty acid profile, it is not, is not so good. The market perception, however, of, of uh, using vegetable oil is good because people say, okay, we are replacing fish oil, fish oil is scarce. There is not a really an issue with uh, with uh, GMOs in rapeseed oil, but price is the most interesting feature. A rapeseed oil is, let's say, half the price of a fish, and that makes it very easily uh, usable in, in fish formulations. Again, you can look back this presentation, I think, in a, in, um, in a video later on, so you can zoom into these uh, topics if you want to know more about it, or you can ask questions later on. With this package of raw materials, protein sources and fat sources, but also, of course, the carbohydrate sources, etc., we're going to into least cost formulation. We're going to make create a feed a feed program. So this is just an example of a, a trout feeding program, how it could look like. But of course, I could make uh, another 20 or 50 different uh, programs like this, uh, where we start from a small size uh, fry feed. Uh, you go to a finishing diet. In this case, we go from uh, a small crumble to uh, seven to 10 millimeter pellets and a protein level of 15 to 14% in uh, fry diet and uh, 38 protein and 24% uh, fat in a finishing diet. These data, together with all the amino acids, etc., etc., are felt fit into a least costing formula. So I just show you a screenshot of a fictive formula. Well, in fact, with a lot of practical applications of how people nowadays in Greece, for example, are formulating sea bass and sea bream diets. But what you can see is on the left side, you feed in all the raw materials. And each raw material, <coughs> and I, in, the, in the bottom you see the hemoglobin meal composition. Um, you put also, you have in this computer program, you have your uh, analysis value for proteins, fats, uh, amino acids, fatty acids, etc., etc. And on the right-hand side, you put your limits of 
uh, protein, fats, amino acids, uh, formulation limits, etc. inside. And the raw materials that you use in this formula are then by the program least costed. So you find the optimal, the cheapest solution for meeting the nutritional requirements that you desire for this diet. But you can imagine that if you're using shitty raw materials in your matrix, you're never going to be, produce a good feed. So this is something you really have to be aware that this, uh, the purchaser together with the nutritionist the, and the one that creates the feeding program, by making the feeding program and the formula, you're basing yourself on the good quality of raw materials to, to have a good quality of final product. So then let's zoom into some, <clears throat> some stability issues. And uh, in this case, I took biological stability. Uh, I took mold prevention as an example. And the reason I do that, uh, I mean, here on the picture, you see a very nice warehouse uh, where you see the pellets, uh, final, final products uh, nicely stacked on pellets. Um, it looks dry. It has air conditioning. Um, but this is not the reality all over the, all over the world. Actually, <clears throat> the majority of aquafeed today is still not stored in proper conditions, either in factories or farms. And due to, in many cases, high ambient temperature and moist, uh, on the farm, limited shelter from rain and sun, and the coinciding fluctuations, high fluctuations in day and night temperatures, and sometimes even rodents and birds eating on the, on the feeding bags, mold is really one of the major issues uh, and mold prevention, of course, as well, um, as a consequence, is one of the major issues in, in aquafit. Why? Why do we want to prevent mold? Well, <clears throat> first of all, the metabolites of molds, the especially the mycotoxins in aquafeed are present due to the contamination of raw materials. So when you don't buy the proper uh, cereals, uh, wheat or uh, corn uh, or uh, tapioca, then you already may have mycotoxins present in your feed. Second way of getting these is to get, if you have too high moisture and or, wa and or water activity after the feed productions, so too little dry in, in extruded diet, uh, too high moisture content in feed ingredients when you're pelletizing and not post conditioning too much, um, or moisture penetrating into the feeding bags uh, due to improper storage <coughs> gives contamination with molds in the final product. And why are these undesirable? Well, first of all, uh, there's a reduction of nutrient value and there are formation of toxic substances as mycotoxins as already matter and as a consequence they are a risk to the farm stock. <clears throat> First an example it's a little bit old literature but it, it was an example of what happened to uh, if a grain gets molded and of course we're looking here at some serious molded grain but the effect was that protein reduced by 20 percent the protein level the lysine level, uh, one of the essential amino acids, reduced by 45%. Vitamin B1 reduced 49%. And niacin, <coughs> vitamin B3, reduced 25%. So you can imagine what the effect will be on the final product. So instead of having the levels that you formulated with, and actually that the ones, the, the diet that you sold to your clients, the actual content of nutrients is much lower when you have a serious molds going on in your product. The mycotoxins effects, in fact, they are not so well documented in aquatic species as for poultry and swine, for example. But anyway, there is literature and this is just some summary of some of the literature that, uh, that I found. Uh, so for different species, different aflatoxins produced uh, found in diets and what are their uh, effects in the, for, the, for the animals. 
Uh, so you can see things like reduced growth, reduced feed consumption, uh, hepatic, hepatic effects, uh, etc., etc. <clears throat> so you don't have to memorize this by heart, of course, but it's just an illustration that molds you don't want them. So one you, thing you can do to prevent mold is to add mold inhibitor. So provided your raw materials are good, <clears throat> your storage is well. If you put mold inhibitor in your um, in your formula when producing it or spray it afterwards, but mostly uh, preferably inside the pellets, um, you create a biological stability uh, for for molds. But be aware. If you look at this example, and I just took it as an example um, because it's so symptomatic from what I see in practice. Uh, when you have, for example, lumps f formed in a feeding machine because your dust content is too high or you have too many fines um, <clears throat> in a feeding machine and you combine that with lack of hygiene on the farm, um, yeah, you get lumps in a feed like this, you get molds of lump of moldy, molded feed. And I think you have to be realistic that you can put whatever mold inhibitor in the feed you want. If these kind of hygiene measures are not taken at a farm level, you cannot prevent this. So mold inhibitors are very useful uh, because we know that circumstances are not always ideal at farm level for storage, um, but it's only a, a tool to help you. So first basis is your raw material quality. Secondly, your processing has to be correct. You can use mold inhibitor to help you uh, to keep, to preserve the quality of your final product for a longer time, but it will not prevent uh, you or it will not, uh, uh, yeah. You still have the obligation to, to use your normal feed hygiene and uh, educate your farmers. Uh, if you're uh, <clears throat> selling your product. So then let's look at physical stability, starch gelatinization. But in fact, uh, both uh, in extruded feeds as shrimp diets, uh, which are mostly pelletized, starch gelatinization is an important factor because with the gelatinization of the starch or the cooking of the starch, you create water stability in the product. So what happens, and I just took the example here uh, as, as, uh, for, for extrusion, uh, the pelletizing process is a little bit different, but there you, um, yeah, the, the, the conditioning of the starch is a little bit different, but just as an example. So basically we are starting with a dry mix, starting with a dry mix of ingredients. You have a pre-conditioning phase where you are uh, moisturizing the, the mix and, and blending it very well. and also you're increasing the temperature. So basically there's a starting of the gelatinization or the cooking of the starch. Then in the extruder, the cooking uh, is uh, continued uh, in the beginning of the, of the extruder at least. There is more mixing and there is a texturizing effect in the extruder <laughs> because of the mechanical energy that is there. And then at the end of the extruder, there is the expansion of the pellet. Uh, there is the cutting of the, 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 the material is pressed through a die and there is a cutter there and the pellet is coming out, is expanding uh, due to the pressure inside of the, uh, of the, or the pressure drop between the inside and the outside of the extruder. <clears throat> and what what happens so here in in physical terms so in the uh, in the preconditioner we see uh, we start with a native starch uh, adding water leads to swelling of the um, of the starch then in the third phase you get the segregation of the molecules that starch is composed of amylose and amylopectin in the extruder that is added so it gets you get a, a kind of jelly like structure and you, on the influence of shear, you get a complete gelatinized product. And after the extrusion product, this, uh, the product solidifies again. So here, I summarize again, swelling of the starches. Then in the extruder, you'll see, <coughs> uh, after the extruder, you see a, a sharp drop in the viscosity. In the extruder, you see a, a sharp drop in the viscosity. 
segregation of amylose and amylopectin molecules. And then post cutter you see an increase in the viscosity. So from a liquid product, it becomes a solid product again. And the amylose and amylopectin merge together again. It's called the retrogradation of the starch. So you form a, a stable structure, which in fact is the, uh, the final result of that is the water stability of the product. And then of course, after the extruder, you have the cooling. So here in the diagram, you see the same what's happening. So why is this important? This is just a, a slide, um, as I mentioned, the water stability and especially the, the, the graph on the right, uh, I want to zoom into. So the degree of starch gelatinization is in a direct, in a linear function of the water stability of the product. So the, the better gelatinization of your starches in your product, uh, in your extruded product, but also in your shrimp uh, diet, pelletized product, um, it, it decides the water stability of the, um, of, the, um, of the final product of your pellets. So what is the impact of this physical stability? Why is this so important? And I just took one example from some of the trials I've been, uh, of some of the trials that I've been running with one of my uh, clients. Um, basically, if you want, what is the goal of a farmer when you're supplying a shrimp diet? Yeah, of course, he wants, the farmer, he or she, uh, the farmer wants fast growth. He wants, or she wants an efficient conversion. So a low feed conversion rate ratio. And he wants <clears throat> a high survival rate because the product of these three, of these three gives the best economic for the farm in theory, because there is also the feed price that has an impact. But I'll come back to that later. So how to achieve that with a shrimp diet? So first of all, for a fast growth, you have to maximize the nutrient intake of the shrimp. So you have to have a good water stability, you have a good tractability and a good palatability because that will guarantee a high feed intake. The optimal nutritional composition, of course, that's a necessity because if the, the shrimp eats something that is not neutral, what he nutritionally, what it, what it needs, still you won't have, let's see, say the desired, the desired result. So you need a good uh, optimal nutritional composition to have an optimal feed conversion. And then you can improve the survival rate, for example, by adding health and digestion supporting additives. And that helps uh, to improve survival rate. There are uh, among a lot of other factors, uh, but this is, let's say the part that the feed producer can do. <clears throat> so, optimal nutrient intake of the shrimp, you need an optimal water stability. So, what does that mean? It has to be, when the pellet is in the water, it has to be soft enough to eat, but avoid, not too soft, to avoid leaching of too many nutrients. It has to be attractive. So, it has to be, it has to leach a little bit to be releasing some molecules that the shrimp can taste and to make them go to the feet. But again, not too much to have all the pellet dissolve in the water. And it has to be palatable. So the shrimp, you want it to eat a lot and therefore you need attractants again. So I'll just give you here some, some examples of what kind of differences you can find in water stability. And actually when, when uh, evaluating uh, shrimp diets um, and, and shrimp formulas, uh, we are looking at three factors or we look at more, but this is let's say the most important one. So word, first of all, the water absorption. Second is the dry matter leaching. And third, the protein leaching. <clears throat> These are six different formulas. Well, actually they are not that much different. Actually they are very similar, but the, the, the processing conditioning uh, conditions have been very different. And then you can see that, for example, between diet 
E and diet C, there is a huge difference in the amount of water absorption. So a level of water absorption, absorption over 120% is really on the high side. It can still be okay, but it's not recommendable. While here in diet E, we only have a water absorption of 91%. Very often there is a there is a relation between the amount of water absorption and the leakage of nutrients. So in this case, we see that the dry matter leaching is 18% and the protein leaching of the diet C is almost 15%. So it means that if a shrimp, a shrimp arrives at the, pellet, at the feed pellet after one hour, 15% of the protein is disappeared. So it has only capacity to grow of uh, of 85% of the nutrients that you originally put inside these pellets. And this may sound very obvious, but it really has a huge impact on performance. If you compare that to diet E, of course, we also see some leakage of nutrients there as well, but there the leakage is only 9%. So without knowing anything about the nutritional composition of the di these diets, the potential of diet E is much, much better than of diet C. If we look at attractability, <clears throat> which is another property that is very much related to the quality and the type of raw materials that you're using, you can do attractability tests. So, <clears throat> And you can test after different times, but actually in this, in this graph, we, we see um, we're testing in fact three, uh, two groups of diets, diets 1A to uh, C and diets 2A to C. In diet, the first one, the first group, you don't see much difference in the attractability, only 7.8 versus 7.1. That's the number of animals eating in such a trial. But in dial two, you see that there is a, really a very big impact of uh, compared diet C to diet A. Uh, so 16, 16 animals and 22 animals are eating. If we then look at feed intake of the same diets, actually you see the same data in the first part of the graph. You can see that also in diet C here, they are, the shrimp consider them much more palatable. So how does that work out in performance? You can see here, in, in, these are the results of diets, uh, the diets 1A to uh, C, that there is really a, quite a big impact on the final growth rate or the final weight that you achieve with these diets. Of course, it's done under, uh, under lab conditions, but we have noticed that you can very well extrapolate the results you find in a lab to the final results you find in a farm. I'll be exactly the same story. But now we still lack, we see that we have a bigger shrimp, but we still lack, lack the knowledge of what is the best diet or what is economically the best diet because the, in the end, the shrimp farmer will decide what is the best quality of diet for him, for his or her farm. So therefore we put, after making the say this growth trial and you see ex exactly the same data here, uh, but a little bit more than that. So we also look at growth per week and specific growth rate and we also include the survival rate um, and the FCR. And you can see that in the FCR, two diets stand out. One B is better than the other ones. Uh, and not purely coincidence, you also see the highest growth per week. Uh, so that was diet B and we saw it already in the graph. The same in diet C. So it's a combination of quality actually that gives the final result. If you that put that in an economical picture, <clears throat> we include the survival rate, the economic uh, FCR, the initial weight, the growth of the shrimp, the feed cost uh, formula, the formula cost and the feed cost, uh, production cost. You can see that diet B in this case has 31 
are almost 32% better economical performance for the farm in the feeding profit. So that is the profit he obtains from the feed he drops into the pond and the shrimp that's coming out of that pond compared to the control diet number A. And in the case of diets two, again, diet C stands out in terms of economic improvement. What I want to point out also with this slide is that in the lower part, in diet two, actually these formulas are exactly the same cost. But by having a better physical quality and a better attractability and shape of the pellet, we are able to make a 23% impact improvement in the profitability of this feed uh, and the quality evaluation of the farmer for this product. In the other case, in diet one, in diets one, we see that here we are using a much more expensive raw materials. But still we can see that we can improve the feeding profit compared to a cheaper diet by 32%. So high feed cost in many cases pays off in an improved economic performance of the farm and feeds water stability, attractability and palatability combined with a nutritional, appropriate nutritional composition determine the final economic performance. So then I come to the summary of my talk. Um, so one, I just keep it short because I see I'm already a little bit over time and I thought so beforehand. So nutritional and the chemical and biological and physical quality and stability are equally important to secure optimal economical performance at farm level. And production and feeding of stable high quality aquafeed requires a multidisciplinary approach of purchasing nutritionist and feed formulator, production, logistics, and on-farm technical support. And don't underestimate the importance of the guys visiting the farmer and looking at his stock and instructing him how to clean his uh, feeding machines and uh, looking at his storage, etc. And this was the last. Thank you very much for uh, my, your attention. And uh, I look forward to answer some of your questions. Thank you, Hans. Really nice presentation. We really thanks for the time you allocated to us. It's, uh, I think, a, a clear message from your presentation how important is the quality uh, on top of the uh, price. Uh, it was nice to see how in um, uh, selecting good quality of raw material uh, will give a, a frequently a better um, payback. Uh, from this, I will open uh, the uh, question session, so you can write your question uh, on the chat um, say, uh, box. Um, while we wait for the first question, uh, uh, the, during your presentation, uh, Hans, we received already some. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would like to place you a first question that is, uh, uh, if you can share your idea on what would be uh, the suitable protein source for aquaculture that can re be used to replace fish meal. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's already a very nice question because uh, I always say to that we are not replacing fish meal in diets. We are replacing nutrients that happen to be also very much present in fish meal. And um, then it's also not a very easy to uh, uh, a very easy to question because it very much depends of the type of species that you're looking at and what kind of level of nutrients that you want to obtain. Um, if you look at freshwater diets, actually there is yeah there is a lot of soybean meal used. Uh, fish meal is in many cases not at all used or and also not really nutritionally necessary. If you look at high density. Um, salmon diets uh, where you have a high demand for protein in your diet and a high demand for uh, oil, uh, the total composition is very much constrained. Huh? That is typically what you see then in the formulation progress, in the process, sorry. Um, so what you see and what are the most likely candidates for replacing fish meal in that case are yeah, stuff like uh, soy protein concentrate, uh, vital wheat gluten, 
Um, but also animal byproducts, yeah, so poultry byproduct meal are very interesting uh, materials or things like uh, hemoglobin meal. They have a high digestibility and a uh, very nice, uh, nice amino acid profile level. Um, let's say in a little bit lower um, in, in shrimp diets, for example, very likely candidates nowadays are, are used a lot are, are uh, indeed uh, poultry byproduct meal. Um, but let's say more novel things coming up and that I expect, uh, expect a lot of are uh, typically uh, bacterial proteins. Uh, also from the sustainability point of view, uh, th these are grown, uh, can be grown on uh, side streams from uh, food industry, for example. Um, also, let's say the uh, other concentrates like uh, we are seeing soybean protein concentrates used a lot in high density diets. Um, but I expect also other initiatives coming up like um, yeah, rapeseed concentrates, uh, rice uh, concentrates, um, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, so there is a lot of them, and but it depends very much of the local situation and what you have available and what is uh, how is the regulations. Yeah, there is a, another question linked to this subject, and uh, I don't know if you have experience, but they are asking, uh, consider the high cost of insect meal, how this can be used as a replacement of fish meal? Yeah, well, I, to be honest, I, I, I am very much reluctant in the area of uh, insect proteins. And I know that uh, the whole world will uh, drop on top of me probably by saying that. But um, at this moment, the cost of insect meal uh, are really very high compared to uh, let's say other alternatives that are in the market and i think we still have a way to go before insect meals are produced at the cost level and just at the sales level uh, sales price uh, which is acceptable for aqua feeds but of course for specific diets it is an, it is an option and then uh, it's a different story when uh, let's say if you're looking at completely green or let's say more green diets, or let's say if you have other sales arguments for your final uh, fish, but let's say the majority of uh, fish farms are not prepared to pay, let's say 30% uh, more for their diet to have um, a diet without fish meal, for example. Okay. Uh, there is a, another question related to now to the mold and they say if you know what is the optimal or the safe water activity level to prevent uh, the mold. I, th I think the, the, the best, uh, I, th I think I also mentioned it in it uh, in my slides uh, somewhere 0 0.65 below that then you're uh, relatively safe but of course the more below that the better. Yeah, if I can add also the uh, uh, uniformity of uh, humidity is also very, very important. You can have a feed with the same most uh, water activity, but uh, for instance, due to the condensation in certain area, you will have a, a spot with a high uh, available of free water and this is where the mold starts. So, yeah, uh, but yeah exactly. Also, you have to consider that, that uh, if you pack your feet too warm, then there's still a lot of moisture uh, coming out of the feet uh, and, and it condenses at the outside of the bag. So uh, it's tricky to really go on the, on the border of what is acceptable because then still you can have issues in the, in the outer side, like you mentioned correctly, uh, Nicola. Um, you can still have this uh, problem. And uh, um, based on your experience, is there any relation between the water activity and the starch gelatinization? That's another question. Um, no, as far as I uh, know, it doesn't have uh, any direct relation. It has more, uh, let's say it's the water level, but also the amount of energy, which is still in the, in the products uh, and how this energy is dis dispersed in the product. But the, the level of starch gelatinization has nothing to do with the uh, with the water activity. Okay. Uh, another interesting question, and uh, if you need a help, just uh, you just ask. <laughs> I can uh, support you. Uh, they're asking what is the difference between a, a toxic binder 
and uh, a mold inhibitor. You mentioned the link between yeah. the mold yeah, and yeah, the Yeah, no, no, it's, 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 it's two okay. complete different things. So a toxin binder is actually binding the toxins after they are produced. So say you have, uh, it is added to bind the toxins that are in, in the feed already, but basically it's like a plaster on the wound. Uh, so it's not preventing and the mold inhibitor prevents the, the, the toxins to be formed. Uh, it prevents the molds to be become active and prevents them to produce the mycotoxins. So they are actually two be, uh, different things. Um, and also there, if you have, let's say, a very bad quality cereal going into your diet, adding a toxin binder, yeah, it doesn't make it a lot better if it's really heavily molded. So it's just, again, a plaster on the wound. It helps to prevent product uh, problems, but of course it's better to prevent product uh, problems before having them in your diet. If I can add just something more. Uh, of course. Uh, yeah, of course there is a link between, okay, mold inhibitor, it's something to prevent the formation of mold. The mycotoxin binder is a much more accurative. So you have the mycotoxins, you bind them. But uh, please note there is not a direct link because there are different research proving that you can have a, a high challenge of mycotoxins, even if you don't have a clear moldy uh, raw material. And this is because part of the mycotoxins are formed in the field before, exactly. before harvesting. But mm -hmm. that's okay. Uh, another question, going back to the starch gelatinization, um, is uh, they are asking how you can improve the starch gelatinization in the feeding process. Uh, pelletized or well, basically, uh, it, it is it's the same for now. It's it is it's slightly different from pelletized and extruded uh, feed, but in all cases, you, what you have to keep in uh, the back of your mind to have gelatinization, you need two main things, and that is moisture and temperature. To have anything going on in the starch in your product, depends a little bit of the type of starch, but let's say, as a rule of thumb, I say you need at least 14% moisture in your, in your mix, and you need at least 85% of temp, uh, sorry, degrees Celsius of temperature to have a gelatinization. If the moisture is higher, it will be better. If the temperature is higher, it will be better. Uh, but these are a prerequisite to have gelatinization. And then you need a certain time. So you need, let's say, a couple of minutes or minutes uh, to, to have the process, to, to have the, the molecules separating and uh, yeah, to have the gelatinization. Um, as a question on this subject, and we move to something else. Uh, they ask it, uh, what is the effect of putting insoluble and soluble fiber in feed formulation? Uh, that's a very good question, and I don't have an immediate uh, exact answer uh, to that. Um, basically, they are, to my knowledge, nobody is adding separately soluble and in insoluble fiber, but of course there is soluble and insoluble fiber in your raw materials uh, present. And uh, especially the soluble fibers seem to have some health benefits. Benefit. But I must say I'm not really a specialist in this area, and uh, but I know it is really an area that has a lot of attention nowadays of, uh, of nutritionists or especially in universities, uh, work is being done on this, but I, I don't have a lot of uh, information on this. Sorry about that. Uh, a simple question. They are asking if the, uh, you were mentioning that one of the important things of starch gelatinization is also the retro degradation. And they are asking if this will happen after the extruder or pelleting. Um, at both, in both cases, uh, it happens uh, because basically the retrogradation is, uh, so first you have, let's say, in the gelatinization process, these molecules are separating and to form a structure again, they have to come together again. And that is what they call the retrogradation. So it happens in both pelletized and extruded, but 
obviously it, it plays a, it has it plays a little bit bigger role in in uh, extrusion because you have a, a higher level usually of gelatinization in extruded diets than in pelletized diets. Uh, changing the subject, but still stay on the quality of raw material. Uh, there is a question about uh, how we can measure the oxidation stability in fish meal. Yeah, that is a, a very good question and also a very important question. Um, it's important that, uh, let's say, you separate the, uh, the oil from the fish meal in a gentle way. Uh, because if you do it in the classical way, you will already induce oxidation in the fish meal. And after that, you determine the classical uh, parameters uh, for oxidation, like uh, a peroxide level, anisidine level, uh, free fatty acids. Um, yeah, the, the, the standard uh, oxidative stability measurements but Nicola you know much more about that <laughs> than me but let's say these are the the classical ones and so it's it's yeah. not different for a fish oil than for uh, for a, sorry for a fish meal uh, than for an oil except for the fact that we have to separate the oil first and you have to do that in a gentle way because if you do that in let's say a uh, yeah, classical way then uh, yeah you have you're inducing oxidation so you don't know what you're measuring I agree with you. So the, that's, there are classic parameters that can be used to uh, prove the oxidation status. Uh, if we look on their stability, there are other tests that can be done, like you can make accelerated tests, uh, despite our experiences that uh, using uh, accelerated tests like uh, oxy test or oxy bomb on uh, matrix like fishy meal is not always uh, responding so well like accelerated test for oil. Uh, other uh, way is uh, eventually to check the uh, self-eating stability of a fish meal eater. This is very important when a, first a fish meal has to be delivered. Um, the last but not the less important, and that's what we always recommend, is to run a really stability test because that's just really uh, uh, give you an idea of what will happen on a fish meal over the storage time. It's a long quality process, but analyzing a batch of fish meal stored in a normal condition uh, in each specific uh, uh, farm and then analyzing this for oxidative but also nutritional parameter because you was mentioned the, the uh, uh, mold like oxidation as an impact on nutritional parameter is a, um, a way to go. Yeah. Uh, something linked to the uh, oxidation also, um, there was a question about what are uh, the sign, um, uh, so what is the negative effect of adding an antioxidant when also hemoglobin meal is added? Um. I don't think there is a negative impact. The, the the problem only with hemoglobin meal, okay, it was also in the overview, um, uh, hemoglobin meal has a high level of iron and iron is a uh, promoter of oxidation. So actually when you're adding uh, a lot of hemoglobin meal in a, in a matrix where you also have, let's say, a lot of unsaturated fatty acids, um, yeah, you kind of trigger oxidation, especially in extrusion. So, um, an antioxidant can, to some extent, prevent that, but actually, um, yeah, it is uh, better to limit your content of hemoglobin meal uh, to a maximum uh, level of uh, normal. Uh, my recommendation is always 8% hemoglobin meal maximum in a, in a diet. Uh, and one that is very vulnerable or has a lot of oil, maybe a little bit less even. Um, so it, it has not an, a negative interaction, but uh, let's say the, the trigger of uh, so much iron in your diet is, is very high. Uh, thanks, Anne. So we are uh, close to uh, uh, our time. I want thanks everyone because uh, we received 
plenty of more questions. We will promise we will process them uh, separately. We will contact you back. So with this, I want to thank uh, Hans Bonn for uh, his uh, intervention and uh, all of you for uh, uh, joining us in our uh, webinar. Thank you again. I wish all the best and as usual, stay safe at home. Thank, thank you, you very much also.